Hi, Brian Miller Hicks, continuing the series of Geology and Earth Science PowerPoint. We're going to tackle groundwater. Groundwater is mostly fresh water. It's that water that's under the ground. It's that water that's held in the spaces between soil, rock, mineral grains, um, sort of like water in a sponge, if you will. It's extremely important to us as a resource for fresh water. Many, many places throughout the world, many, many people, billions of people possibly, cannot go into a kitchen or a bathroom and turn on a tap and get fresh water that way. They have to dig for it. They have to dig wells so that groundwater can then flow into those wells and they can extract it by pumping or by bailing. So groundwater, is often not thought of because we don't see it, but it's there. And even here, even in San Diego County, where I am, there are many people that live out in the rural parts of the county that rely on wells for their fresh water for irrigation, drinking, bathing, cleaning, and so forth. So this is a picture photo of Montezuma Well in Arizona. It's not a hand dug well. It's a natural well, if you will. That's part of what we call karst topography. So these are limestones, the whitish rocks you see here. Limestones are vulnerable to dis dissolution, dissolving by slightly acidic groundwater and rainwater. Through time, they can actually erode away and develop huge voids in these landscapes, which then fill up with groundwater um, and become natural wells or lakes, if you will. So we'll touch more on that as we go on later in this presentation. The hydrologic cycle is that cycle, cycle where fresh water is supplied to the planet from the atmosphere by rainfall, precipitation, falling over land and sea. Some of this water in the oceans evaporates from heat. So too does water from lakes and rivers. There is also evaporation there. Transpiration is the release of water by plants and trees. Now when the water falls from the sky as rain or snow, which later melts, some of this water just runs off right into the sea. Some of it ends up in rivers, which flow to the ocean, or in lakes. And, part, and some of this water that's held in lakes and rivers infiltrates into the ground, becomes that resource that we know of as groundwater. So groundwater, the origins of groundwater are from water that accumulates or is filtered through, infiltrated through the ground from rainfall, snowmelt, rivers, and lakes. So we'll look at this graphic of total global water distribution. Most of our water is salty, salt water in the oceans. Surprisingly, only 2.8% of water on this planet is fresh water. Of that fresh water, most of it is locked up in glaciers and ice now. Now that ratio may be changing slightly because of climate change. We're getting more melting of glaciers and ice caps, Antarctica and Greenland. The next biggest slice of the freshwater pie is groundwater, freshwater resource. Only this thin light blue slice here you see is stream channels, atmosphere, soils, lakes, freshwater lakes, okay? Freshwater of the hydrosphere. Now, as you know from earlier discussion of the four spheres of our planet, the biosphere, the geosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, which includes the cryosphere of the frozen water, um, again, volume of fresh water in ice sheets and glaciers is the predominant volume. And then we have, which is 85% of our fresh water. About 14% of our fresh water is groundwater. 
So what is groundwater? How does it occur? Where does it live, so to speak? If you look at this landscape here, so here's a hillside, another hillside coming down. Here's a stream. And this blue area below the ground surface is what we know of as the saturated zone or the zone of saturation. In the zone of saturation, every pore, every space between soil grains, rock grains, within fractures of bedrock, within that zone of saturation is filled with water. That's where groundwater is in those void spaces. Above the zone of saturation, we have the unsaturated zone, which still may have some water within the voids, but it doesn't fully occupy all the void space. Void spaces in the unsaturated zone have a little bit of water, but are mostly gases, air, if you will, filling those voids. So at the interface between the unsaturated zone and the zone of saturation is that surface, is that contact that we call the water table right here. It's the top of the saturated zone, the bottom of the unsaturated zone. Now, if you look at this picture again down here, you see that the shape or the orientation of the water table pretty much closely mimics the topography of the ground surface. In other words, you have sloping terrain here, hilly terrain, and you also have a sloping water table. The water table descends from the higher elevations towards this stream, which is the lowest point of the valley. And it's a rule of water table and groundwater physics that groundwater moves from zones of high pressure to zones of low pressure. The water, if you take an elevation line, let's say here, the water here is under fairly high pressure because of the weight of the water above it. At the same elevation down here, the water is at a lower pressure because there's not much water sitting up above it. So the ground surface here actually intersects the water table and that's why we have a stream. It's not generally typically well known that streams and rivers are not filled up by rainwater and, and uh, by rainwater alone. Most of the way that a river maintains water in its channel year round is by intercepting the water table. In other words, water flows from the water table into the stream channel and keeps it filled. Now, if you have dry years or a series of dry years where you have very little rainfall, the water table cannot replenish itself streams dry up. So this dashed line that you see here, it represents a lower water table because of drought, because of a low supply of precipitation. In this case, the water table now drops below the bottom of the river channel. Therefore, this stream will not be full of water. It'll dry up. Another look at pretty much the same graphic, but a few more items to note here. The way that we get water from a water table is by drilling and installing wells. You can see here that this well, like a straw in a soda or a milkshake, what have you, this straw does not reach all the way to the water table Therefore, you're not getting any water in the well. If we had a series of very rainy years, maybe the water table would rise and we could now pump water from the well. Here's a well that we're getting water from, but this is deceptive. This is what we call a perched water table, which is limited in size. It's just water 
that's hung up on this layer of clay of impermeable material. And impermeable material means the water cannot penetrate it. Therefore, it ponds or mounds up above this material. And now it's trapped on top. And if we sink a well here, we can get water out of it. But we might drain all the water out of this perch water table because it's limited in volume. It'd be better to go through this layer and into the main water table. Any layer that prevents or slows down water from moving through the ground is called an aquitard. It's also called an aquaclude, but we'll use aquitard in this case. One other thing to note is that groundwater feeds what we know of as springs. In this graphic, it's showing a rock, let's say it's a sandstone, rain falls down, penetrates through the rock, then it hits this clay layer, and it has no choice now to come out of the hillside running on top of the clay because the clay is stopping it from going down farther into the mountain. That brings up two very important concepts when we're talking about groundwater. It's porosity and permeability that have to do with the capacity of a soil or rock body to contain, to accept, and to transmit groundwater. So porosity is a measure of the percentage of voids in a rock or a soil mass. In this illustration, we have a beaker with gravel or pebbles in it. Turn on the tap. See, there's a lot of open spaces here that water then can then fill up. Once, it, once this glass beaker fills up, then it creates a saturated zone of water filling the pore spaces between these pieces of rock or pebbles or gravel. So the more pores or the higher the void space there is in a rock or soil mass, the higher the porosity is. So water follows from, in this case, the water can follow from pore to pore. There's open channels, open uh, ways or pathways for water to, f to follow and fill up all these spaces. So this is a highly porous material. And it's also permeable because it allows water to transmit from one space to another space to another space. The pores are all connected, as you see here. Property of permeability relies on pores, but it's the property that tells us that the pores are interconnected. The most permeable soils and rock masses have many pathways for water to follow, connecting one pore or one void space to another void space. Okay, so you can have a very porous material that's highly permeable because the pores are interconnected. You can also have a porous material like a clay that has a lot of individual tiny, tiny pores, but the pores are so tiny and there's very little connectivity between the pores that the clay material is actually impermeable. I am permeable. It's porous, but impermeable. Okay, so let's look at how groundwater flows through the ground. Groundwater flows slowly. It doesn't rush like a river. When you ask the man on the street or the woman on the street, what do you think of when you think of groundwater? They'll often say, oh, underground rivers. Well, yeah, we do have underground rivers, but only in the case of cavern systems, which are open chambers beneath the surface of the earth where you actually have underground rivers, underground lakes, which we'll look at later. But most groundwater flows very slowly 
and it flows under the influence of gravity. It flows in the unsaturated zone straight down. In the saturated zone, it goes from pore to pore, and it's governed by gravity and pressure. So again, as I've already mentioned, this river valley here, this river valley here, is a zone of low pressure because there's very little water up above the water table. Over here, at the same elevation, the pressure is higher. So that means under the influence of gravity and pressure, the water is being forced to travel through the saturated zone towards the zone of low pressure ending up here. And it doesn't necessarily follow straight paths. It typically follows curved paths like we see here. So recharge is a zone on the ground surface where precipitation falls. Discharge is where the groundwater table intersects a river valley or stream valley point of low pressure and ends up at the surface. This can also be a spring or a geyser. And groundwater takes, can take a long time. Some groundwater takes just a few years to go from a mountaintop to a valley floor or to a stream. Some takes thousands of years, travels much more deeply through many, many tens of feet or hundreds of feet of rock and soil. And maybe it only gets to the surface by hitting a fault. And under pressure, it travels up the fault and rises as springs at the fault. If you go to Palm Springs and you, or Borrego Springs and you go to um, some of the canyons like Palm Canyon in Palm Springs region, you'll see wet areas where there's many, many palm trees lined up along a line. And those are areas where like, a, I think it's called a Thousand Palms. Those are areas where water is right, groundwater is rising up along faults and coming out at the surface to water the trees in effect. Again, when you have a, a high water table and it's filling a stream, that's a gaining stream. The stream is gaining water from the water table, from groundwater. The opposite case in a desert area, a desert zone, for example, you might have a river that's flowing on the desert ground surface, but it's losing water to the water table down below. The water table is not connected to the stream. The water table is not supplying water to the stream. Therefore, eventually, if you go to the desert and you witness a huge rainstorm, you might see streams and rivers flowing on the desert surface, but hours later or days later, the stream may totally dry up because the groundwater table is way down below the ground surface and the stream leaks its water down into the desert sands and goes away. Springs, geysers, wells, and artesian system. The springs are handy things to have if you're trying to build a town or a city. Many towns and cities, in fact, have, no pun intended, sprung up around springs. Palm Springs is one example, Spring Valley here in San Diego County, Saratoga Springs, uh, Colorado Springs. So these cities and towns names have the word spring in them for a reason, because they were built around a source or a supply of fresh water, which came out of hillsides or out of the ground as freshwater springs. Geysers, of course, are springs in a sense, water under pressure, but it's hot water. So let's go through all this. This is a spring coming out of a cliff face. So water is coming down 
as rainfall, penetrating through pores and fractures in the rock, then hitting a, perhaps a, an impermeable layer, and then exiting the cliff face as a spring. Nice fresh water spring with cool, clean, hopefully, water. This is a geyser. This is the old, famous, old faithful geyser in Yellowstone National Park. I've seen it. Those of you who've seen it, it's, it's a sight to see. Those of you who haven't seen it, I would encourage you to go. Um, a geyser is a case where hot water is under pressure and it erupts or blows out at the surface of the earth. So in the case of Yellowstone and Old Faithful, Yellowstone is a volcanic area called a caldera where groundwater gets heated by the proximity or and presence of a magma chamber or hot rock down below heats up the groundwater. The groundwater under pressure down there becomes superheated and then as there is an avenue or a pathway to the earth to the ground surface there's a pressure release and the hot water under pressure and comes shooting out as it as superheated water which then um, as it, it sends higher and higher pressure becomes less and less the water accelerates more and more and comes out as a very rapid jet of hot water and steam and if you're lucky enough to see this in the winter, some of that hot water and steam will turn to ice and snow if it's cold enough. Um, I mentioned wells previously. Let's take a look at a, an example of how wells are used and misused. So this graphic shows a farm homestead with a well penetrating the water table so it's getting water pumped out and serving the house or houses up here these are presumably farm fields agricultural fields this well is quite short this well is really long so this well is being pumped a lot because it's being used for to uh, water crops for example that tends to actually lower the water table surface so that what develops is called a cone of depression. Water again moves from high pressure to low pressure. The low pressure point in this case is the well boring. As water continues to get withdrawn <coughs> and water table is not resupplied by adequate precipitation, the water table lowers and depresses. Now what's happened? Well, this person here, maybe he's a neighbor, maybe he doesn't have anything to do with his agricultural operations here. Now he can't get any water because the water table has been lowered. So heavy pumping can cause problems or neighboring wells or wells around a, a well that's being heavily used. Let's talk about artesian wells. An artesian well is a well that doesn't have to be pumped. So here's an artesian well. Water just comes out of it spontaneously without having to pump. Why is that? That's because the head of the well is below what we call the pressure surface, which is here, this line. So let's look at this. Here's the recharge area. Rain clouds, lots of storms in a hilly area. Water flows into this layer here, which we call an aquifer. Remember I talked about aquitard earlier as an impermeable layer. Well, an aquifer, aquifer, is a layer that both accepts water and transmits water within it. Water easily flows through an aquifer. Aquifer means water carrier. So this well number one goes right into the aquifer and you get water and you get 
uh, well water out of it, but you have to pump it out because the top of the water table, which is here, is not quite at the ground surface. The top of the water table, as defined by water in this aquifer, is up here. It's not down here, it's not down here. This is what we call a confined aquifer because it's sandwiched between an aquitard here and an aquitard here. So high pressure or high head of water here that's driving water downwards. You drill another well and you get lucky because this well, the head of this well is below the top of the water table as expressed by this pressure surface. So it gives you water spontaneously without having to pump. Saves you a lot in buying electricity because you don't have to run a pump, right? Okay, this is a close up of well number one. The pressure surface or the top of the water table is below the top of the well. So you have to pump it. And here it's above, so you don't have to pump it. That's an artesian well, a self-flowing well. Here's an example of a fountain built around an artesian well in a park because the pressure surface is up here somewhere. Okay. All right, let's talk about groundwater problems. You might call it groundwater issues as well. It's the issues or problems that come about when we misuse groundwater as a resource. We over pump wells, um, we contaminate wells and contaminate groundwater. So as a result of these actions, groundwater becomes less of a resource to us and we're limited in using this. We don't want to use contaminated water we can't use water that's not there, okay? This is an odd photo, isn't it? What's happening here? Subsidence due to groundwater withdrawal. When you have groundwater in an aquifer, let's say in a sandstone, deep down below the surface of the earth, let's say 100 feet, and you pump out the water and pump out the water and pump out the water, if it's a sand that's really not very hard, or if it's a clay, or if it's a, a silt, if you withdraw the water sometimes, that layer can compact itself because the water's been withdrawn from the pore spaces, so the pores, so the grains settle into each other and compact together. That has the effect of lowering the ground surface as layers down here compact as layers down below compact the ground surface sinks and we get what we call subsidence this is a major problem this photo shows in the year 1925 in the san joaquin valley of california in 1925 ground surface was up here in 1977 is down here. So 52 years of immense groundwater withdrawal to, to nourish the agricultural industry in San Joaquin Valley has lowered the ground surface 52 feet. I'm sorry, uh, about 25 feet, I think, over 52 years. Okay, nine meters, it says. So that's about 30 feet. So nine meters from 1925 to 1977. We can also get subsidence if we extract not just water, but oil as well. So the same principle applies here. These um, pylons that you see here, the white painted parts originally were underground and the ground surface has sunk or subsided that much. This is a map of the continental U.S. that shows, shows areas of, of uh, ground subsidence by groundwater pumpage and also oil and gas extraction. Huge sections of East Texas, Louisiana, 
Mississippi, Arkansas, the Atlantic Coast, uh, Midwestern states, and here's San Joaquin Valley. That photo example I showed you of the subsiding ground occurred somewhere in here near San Jose. What happens if you're near the ocean and you have a well and you're pumping a lot of water? Well, fresh water is lighter, less dense than salt water. So if you pump too much fresh water out, that causes a Kona depression and thins out this floating lens of fresh groundwater so that now you're having you're getting salt water coming into the bottom of your well. That's not a good thing. You don't want salt water. You can't shower with salt water. You can't soap up with salt water. You can't feed your plants. You can't drink it, obviously. So salt water intrusion by over pumping of fresh water near the oceans is an issue as well. Here's a contamination example contamination of groundwater by sewage. Um, many residences in rural areas are not hooked up to municipal sewers. They don't have their sewage going directly into a pipe that gets transported to a sewage treatment plant. Instead, they have a system of a septic tank and a leach field. Waste goes into the septic tank. It's the solids settle down, settle out, and the liquid gets transmitted into, it's not shown here, but it, it should be transmitted in, transported into a leach field, which is a series of trenches filled with pipes and gravel. Hopefully the soil will take that wastewater, absorb it, and clean out the bacteria, viruses, and other nasty stuff. But what if your leach field is too close to this inclined impermeable layer? What if the soil is not right for absorbing and stripping out the bacteria and viruses? Then the contaminated water can actually travel down slope along this tilted bed, hit the water table, and go into this well. And this well is now extracting contaminated water to this house. That is not a good situation. One of the interesting geologic phenomena, phenomena associated with groundwater is the development of karst landscapes, caves, and sinkholes. Karst is a German word which um, is used to name that type of landscape that's characterized by underlying limestone which has been dissolved by slightly acidic rainwater and groundwater. You recall as rainwater falls through the atmosphere, it picks up carbon dioxide and becomes a weak carbonic acid. When it, when it hits the ground and goes through the ground, picks up more carbon dioxide and becomes a little more acidic, a little more carbonic acid. If you're in a limestone terrain, that rainwater and groundwater can dissolve the limestone underneath your house, underneath your roadway, underneath your bridges, what have you. It can create voids. And that's how we get caves, is by the creation of voids by dissolution of limestone. So this is a graphic of karst topography. We have a very high water table in limestone. The high acidic water in groundwater and the water table is starting to dissolve this limestone. You're starting to de develop voids which reach all the way to the surface and become sinkholes. This stream etches its way through that dissolving limestone and becomes deeper. And the final result is a variety of features characteristic of karst landscapes where you have a etched stream, you have uh, sinkholes, which form because all this, this limestone, which was formerly 
underneath groundwater had been dissolved away. So as the groundwater is higher over here and the stream started etching its way into the limestone, started intercepting more and more groundwater, which in effect lowers the groundwater. And so here you see the creation of more voids. They're still filled with the groundwater. So let me state this. Voids in karst terrain, including caverns and sinkholes, occur and are formed only when the limestone is saturated with groundwater. Then the groundwater table can drop and we're left with cavern systems or open sinkholes, as you see here. And it's a very characteristic landscape, which if you look at an aerial photo of a section of Florida, these are all sinkholes formed by dissolution of limestone by groundwater. They're now filled with water. They're not good places to build. I guess you build around them. But every now and then, and I'm not sure why people build without investigating these terrains first, but every now and then you get the rapid formation of a sinkhole where maybe there wasn't one before. And they can actually cause a lot of damage by their formation. So you have rain, carbonate bedrock. Carbonate, of course, is limestone, calcium carbonate. You get the formation of a void, the draining of soil into the void, and the collapse and sinking of the surface here into a sinkhole. It's a solution sinkhole. I'm sorry, this is a solution sinkhole. This is a subsidence sinkhole where the ground surface is subsiding. Here you have a total collapse where everything above the void, including rock, including soil, just collapses into that void in the form of a sinkhole. And any one of these sinkhole types can damage property and structures as you see here. This house is being entirely swallowed by a sinkhole, which is almost circular in, in shape. This is in Florida. In Mexico, you have huge extensive areas of limestone terrain in the Yucatan Peninsula, for example. And this is an actual, this is actually is a sinkhole that they call a cenote, which is filled with water. Um, you can swim in these. The water is very fresh, clean, uh, clear. Hopefully this person is swimming and not just floating there. Um, and so they're beautiful places, uh, but don't build above one because you might cause yourself a lot of grief. Let's take a look at caverns. Caverns are amazing places to visit. Underground chambers, of dissolved limestone, flowing streams, lakes, and many various forms of what we call speleothems, S-P-E-L-E-O-T-H-E-M, as the speleothem is a rock formation that's formed within the cavern environment. In this photo, Water is dripping from the ceiling of the void that was formed by dissolution of limestone, carrying dissolved calcium carbonate with it. As a drop forms, a little bit of calcium carbonate comes out of solution and dries up, forming a ring. And then more water drips, forms another ring. More water drips, forms another ring, lower and lower and lower. So the succession of rings of calcium carbonate mineral stack up and form hollow straws like you see here. In Carlsbad Caverns, which I visited many years ago, which is astounding, it's a giant cavern system. The main chamber is something like a thousand feet long, but it's 
well worth the trip and it's actually not very far from Southern California. This is a column of limestone formed by dripping uh, uh, calcium carbonate from the ceiling piling up on the floor below. A speleotherm which points down from a cavern ceiling is called a stalactite, C for ceiling. A speleotherm which projects up from the ground from the floor of a cavern upwards by dripping calcium carbonate building up from the floor is called a stalagmite for ground. And there's many other varieties of speleotherm which are quite beautiful. This is Luray Caverns in Virginia with a nice underwater pond. This is the Caverns of Sonora in Texas, which are, is a very active cavern system still forming many different types of crystalline calcium carbonate um, formations. And you can see this one is in the shape of a butterfly. It's really beautiful. Here in Sonora, um, Mexico, I'm sorry, in Sonora, Texas, you also have stalactites, which look like clubs. They're called war clubs. So if you take this whole process to the extreme, the formation of caves, the formation of karst topography, this has been going on for thousands, maybe a couple million years here in this province in China. So everything you don't see here used to be limestone, but it all dissolved away, leaving only these towers of limestone as remnants of a thick plateau of limestone, which used to exist, but now has been eroded away. And that's it for groundwater.